Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over the January 2025 Living Environment Regents exam. In this video, we're going to be focusing on part B2, which are 12 multiple choice and short response questions, each worth one point. Uh, a link to this test can be found in the description of this video if you want to follow along at home. And this video is a part of a bigger series where I'm going to go over every single problem from every single part of this test. So the videos that are going over part A, B1, and D are already posted. The links to them will be found in the description of this video if you want to continue. That being said, we're going to start off with number 44, which asks us to identify the organism in the diagram that became extinct about 60 million years ago, right? So the way that this works is each organism essentially evolves, right? Each node is at a point where an evolution occurred. So X evolved into A, A split up and evolved into B and E, E to G and F, so on and so forth. And the closer up or the higher up you go, the closer to the present you are until you are actually in the present time, like populations J, K, and N are. So it's asking us, identify the organism in the diagram that became extinct about 60 million years ago. So obviously, if something is extinct, it's no longer in the present, which means that it stopped evolving and it died off before it could reach the present time. So I know that 60 million years ago is about between 50 million and 75 million years ago. So there's two choices I can choose from that are between 75 and 50, because I know that 60 has to fall between these two uh, intervals, right? So the correct answer here is going to be organism D, simply because it's closer to 50, right? Organism C is far too close to 70 in order for me to consider that 60 million years ago, right? The halfway point between uh, 50 and 75 million years ago is going to be about 62.5 million years ago. That's the halfway point between these two points, right? So we want something that's slightly above the halfway point, right? Which is actually going to be point D. Moving on to numbers 45 to 48. There, this is just a bunch of information about loons, right? I'm not going to read it out loud because I think that's going to be a waste of time for us. So I'm just going to, I'm going to give you the time to read it right now. You can pause the video, read it, and then I'm going to move on to the data table. So at the end of this, it says that the data table below shows the number of adult loons and chicks counted in southern parts of Maine between 1985 and 2020. Okay, so this is the data that was collected. And 45 asks us to mark an appropriate scale without any breaks in data on each labeled axis below. So in this case, they already decided for us what's going to go on what axis. On the Y, we're going to put number of loons. On the X, we're going to put the number of years. So whenever we want to do a scale, we want to essentially assign numbers on the Y and numbers on the X that represents or that captures all the data points in our set. So in this case, our, our set starts at or our data starts at 1985 and ends at 2020. So whatever I label here has to capture those two dates. Whatever I label here has to capture those two dates. And whatever whatever I label on my y-axis has to capture a range from 200 all the way to 2,974, 2, right? So in this case, I'm just going to count by twos, right? I'm going to start my x-axis at uh, 1986. And I'm just going to count by twos until I reach 2020. Because the way that this the, these um, hash marks are set out is that if I count by two every single time, I will have enough space to go all the way up to 2020, right? If this is 1986, then this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, right? So that's 17 boxes. If each box is an increase by two, I'm increasing by 34. I already know that um, 1985 plus 34 is going to give me 9. It's going to be give me about 2019 or 2020. Okay, so that's enough space for me. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to label that and I'll see you guys in a bit. So I just finished labeling my x axis. So I can see here that I am increasing by two every single time. So any point between here is going to be an odd number, right? So for example, um, right over here between 1986 and 1988, you're gonna have 1987. The important part is that this interval pretty much captures uh, all the points that I need, right? Uh, I know that 1985 is going to be between these two points, so I will I go all the way up to 2020, so I'm good, right? Now, a, a quick note to, to, to follow here is that whenever you have a graph, the origin doesn't need to start at 0, 0. And actually, this is written on the grading criteria for this exam, right? It says, do not assume the intersection of the x and y axis is the origin 0, 0 unless it's labeled. So it's actually okay if you begin graphing here and you put 1984 um, right here, right? It's okay. This doesn't have to represent 0. You don't have to start counting by thousands in order to reach uh, 1984, right? So this can start at any number that you want. 
this origin right here. So now that I have my time graphed, I need to do something more trickier, which is I need to graph my y-axis. Um, so I need to calculate, well, the maximum point that I need to put here is 3,000, right? So I need to make sure that whatever I increase by, I end up going to 3,000, and I think I'm going to increase by 400s, right? Y-axis set. So that's all the credit for number 45. All I had to do was to correctly set or assign a set of axes that contains all my data. It contains the point 200 and 2,974, and it also contains 1985 all the way up to 2020. So now all I have to do is plot the data. So it says to plot the data for adults and chicks with the directions below. Plot the data for the loon adults on the grid and connect the points, surround each point for loon adults with a small triangle. So again, all I have to do here is look at my graph, look at the loon adults chart right here, and then plot those points. This is three points, guys. So I know that loon adults uh, starts at 1985, and the population of loon adults uh, is going to be about 1,470, so it's going to be somewhere over here, right? Pretty close down to 1,400. So you put your point, and then always follow the shape that they want around it. They want triangles around it. So just quickly draw a triangle, and you'll be fine, okay? So and make sure to connect your points with the straight edge ruler. So make sure to draw straight lines between those two points, okay? I don't have a straight edge ruler with me right now, so it's kind of difficult, but on this test, you will be able to have one. So if you connect the points, this is the trend that you should get, right? These lines should be straight. And now all you have to do is the same thing for the chick data. So once you have that, all you have to do is connect them with a the straight line. Again, I don't have a straight edge ruler on me, so my lines are gonna be curved, but your lines are gonna be straight, all right? So this is how you get full points on this question. All you have to do was just plot it like this. That's all. So number 47 relies on this, these two graphs. Number 47 asks, with the best explanation for why loon populations did not show a rapid change in size during the Maine and New York studies is what or is why? Well, let's take a look here. So below are the two are two graphs showing the number of loon adults, immature loons, and chicks observed during the annual loon census conducted in the Auburn Society of New York on the lakes and ponds throughout the Adirondack Park in New York State. So we see that there's a lot of chick, a lot of adults, chicks, and not a lot of immature loons. Here we have a lot of adults, more chicks, and more immature loons. So this this difference is mainly because it takes seven years for them to reach sexual maturity. If we go ahead and go back into this blurb over here, right, we see that that's that information is is uh, revealed to us, right? Um, the loons typically produce one or two chicks per year. The chicks are slow to mature. Usually they are seven years old because before their first successful breeding season. So that means that between 2001 and 2020, the number of adults, they're still reaching sexual maturity, right? So it takes them seven years just to be able to produce or to be able to be sexually mature, meaning that they can even begin to sexually reproduce, right? So because they are, because it takes them seven years to reach sexual maturity, the number of adults here did not produce a crazy amount of chicks because they're still, they are still um, essentially becoming sexually mature, right? So the best explanation for why loon populations did not show a rapid change in size during the Maine and New York studies is because they take a very long time and they also don't produce a crazy amount of chicks, right? They only produce two chicks. So that doesn't mean that, so because it takes so long for them to mature and because they produce so little chicks, that's why we're not gonna have a crazy big increase, all right? Number 48 says, compare the trend in loon population sizes over time represented in the two New York graphs above to the trend observed in the data table for the southern part of Maine. Support your answer with information from the New York graphs and main data table. All right. So we're comparing the graphs. So look, look what we can say, right? In 2001, the number of adults was 308. In 2020, the number of adults was 551. In the main, we see that the number of adults also increased, right? So it increased by a big number and then slowed out. So that's one of our comparisons. We can just say that in both New York and main the number of adult loons and chicks increased that is one fair point that we can earn here right because this increased and we can see here how our lines were also going up 
So both of them increased, right? We could also said that in 2001, there was 308 chicks and 50, 308 adults and 59 chicks in New York. And then this number increased to 51, 551 adults and 70 chicks in 2020. And in Maine, it followed a similar trend with an increase in the population of adults and chicks. In 2000, we could also said that in New York and Maine, the number of loons increased during the study. And we could support that by saying that in Maine, there were 2,780 adult loons in 2010. And in 2020, there were 2,974. In New York, there were 3,008 in 2001 and 551 in 2020. So by supporting your claim with data, all you have to show is that there was an increase. So in my answer, doesn't really include that. But if you just write that, 2001, there was 308, 2020, for New York, there was 551. Don't write it like this, but you could just, I'm just shorthanding it for you guys. So again, as long as you compare the two numbers and with this, those two times, right? Oh, we started in 2001 with 308, ended with 551 in 2020. We started with, you know, this in 1985 and ended with this in 2020. Then that'll give you full credit too, right? So the graph shows the effect of stopping smoking at different ages, along with the cumulative, list, cumulative risk in percent from dying from lung cancer up to age 75 in men. The study took place in the UK. So we can see how the cumulative, cumulative risk of developing cancer increases the longer it takes for you to stop smoking. So 49 says that doctors claim that the earlier someone stops smoking, the lower the risk of dying from lung cancer, which statement best describes evidence that supports this claim. So the correct answer here has to be two, right? Men that continued to smoke had an approximately 16% risk of death, and those that stopped at the age of 30 had a lower risk, right? If we see here, men that continued to smoke cigarettes have a 16% chance of death from lung cancer, right? But men that stopped at the age of 60 as they continue to age, even if they stopped at the age of 60, they only have a 10% risk. People that were lifelong non-smokers have less than a 2% of dying from cancer. People that stopped at age 30, which is this dashed line right here, again, less than a 2% chance or risk of dying from cancer. So the earlier you quit, essentially, the lower your risk for developing lung cancer gets, right? That's how we read this graph. And that's how we interpret it. Um, base your answers to 51 and 50 and 51 on diagram below in your knowledge of biology. So this represents the human and uh, the human female and male reproductive organs. So 50 says the two labeled structures that produce gametes and hormones are what? Well, in women or females, the gametes are produced in the ovaries, which is represented by B. And in males, the gametes and hormones are produced by the testes, which is represented by E. So their answer should be B and E, which is choice two. 51 says pelvic inflammatory disease and sexually transmitted infections can lead to blockage of the structures represented by letter A. These are the fallopian tubes. Explain how this blockage would interfere with the formation of a zygote. So the so what happens in the fallopian tubes is that the sperm will, will enter the uterus and it will travel into one of the fallopian tubes. At the same time, the egg, the, during ovulation, the egg will be traveling down one of these fallopian tubes and it will meet the sperm in the fallopian tube to get fertilized. And when this fertilization happens, a zygote is essentially formed, right? So this blockage, if it was blocked right here, this blockage could prevent the sperm from fertilizing the egg. It could also ensure that the sperm will be prevented from reaching the egg because it wouldn't even be able to enter the fallopian tube if it was fully blocked off. Um, it could cause inf infertility because gametes won't combine. And... Um, it could prevent fertilization in humans. So those are all answer choices that would have gotten you full credit for this. As long as you mention the fact that some sort of fertilization will not occur or it will be interfered because this tube will be blocked, right? So anything I just said would have given you full credits here. 52 says that detrivores are animals that consume and break down dead plant and animal matter from ecosystem. Explain why the decline and extinction of many species of detrivores may have negative consequences on the stability of an ecosystem. So the whole point of detrivores, the whole point of animals that that connect, uh, that um, decompose dead tissue and dead matter is, and why they're so important is because they are able to recycle nutrients into the back into the soil. Right, so we say that detrivores recycle nutrients and are needed for ecosystem stability. That would get you full points, right? As long as you acknowledge the fact that detrivores are needed to make a stable environment because they recycle dead matter back into the soil for producers to use, that would have given you full credit here. 
right? You could have also said that the nutrient cycle would be disturbed because of their um, extin extinction. You could also said that if detrivores were removed, the dead organisms would not be able to be broken down into the ecosystem and there would not be enough nutrients for other organisms. So again, the point of these decomposers or detrivores is to recycle nutrients back into the soil, okay? So 53 and 54 says that a research team of students added water and an experimental enzyme to a jar containing a piece of a type of plastic that is commonly used in food packaging. Several days later, the plastic was no longer visible. Identify one factor that would influence the rate at which the experimental enzyme breaks down this type of plastic. So in this case, you just need to know what are the factors that break down, that affect enzyme speed. Those factors are pH, temperature, the concentration, of enzyme or the concentration of the substrate. So this was just a memorization question. If you wrote down any one of these four terms, you would have gotten full credit. So the pH of the solution uh, it impacts the rate of the reaction, the rate of the enzyme, right? The temperature affects the enzyme, right? Higher temperatures can denature, lower temperatures can slow down the reaction. The concentration of enzyme also speeds it up. You have more enzyme. That means that you're able to speed it up even more. If you have more substrate, that means that the enzymes are, are working slower because there's more to process, right? So all of these factors influence the speed of an enzyme. 54 relies on this blurb right here. It says the research team claimed that the experimental enzyme would break down all plastics. The students repeated the experiment with different types of plastic. This time, the plastic was not broken down by the enzyme. Explain why the enzyme was not able to break down all types of plastics. So what makes an enzyme special? Well, remember, enzymes are specific to a certain substrate. So enzymes are very specific in their, in their function. Your body has hundreds and millions and thousands of different enzymes because they are so specific, right? So the reason why it's not able to break down all types of plastics, you could say that enzymes are specific. You could also say that enzymes react with substrate based on shape. So this type of plastic may, might have had a different shape, right? The active site where the substrate binds, the substrate is the thing that you're changing, um, could have had a different shape. Let's say the original plastic had this shape so it could fit into this substrate. But let's say that this brand new substrate, you know, was triangle shaped. It wouldn't be able to fit into the active site. <coughs> Finally, you could have said that because uh, it, it is not able to break down all types of plastic because the enzyme and substrates do not fit, right? Or the substrate will not fit inside of the active site of the enzyme. So those, those three reasons would have given you full credit for, for that question. Right, number 55 asks us to identify one concern other than its effectiveness that people might have before using it in their home. And we're basing this off of this blurb right here. So ultrasonic pest repellents are electronic devices designed to repel and remove household pets. When plugged in, they produce ultra, -fre ultra high frequency sound waves to chase away mice, rats, fleas, cockroaches, silverfish, and spiders. The sound that these devices make cannot be heard by humans. These pest control devices are often used in environments where the use of poison is prohibited or not recommended. So identify one concern other than its effectiveness that people might have before bringing it into their home. So first of all, what's the one reason you would buy, you would or wouldn't buy a product? Well, if it's good for you. So one concern of this is, well, is this noise going to impact my health, right? Is this healthy for me? If exposing myself to, is exposing myself to a high ultra frequency sound gonna hurt my head? Is it going to give me headaches? Is it going to make me sleep less? The major concern before you do anything to your body or before you buy anything is usually, how is it going to impact me? So that's one perfect question. One concern is, is it safe for people? What effect will it have on people? Another, another statement you could have put was, will it harm pets and household pets such as cats and dogs? Because remember, cats and dogs have really good hearing. So perhaps they the, the animals will be harmed by this ultrasonic um, noise that it's playing. Maybe they will be able to hear it constantly, but humans won't because we have worse ears, right? So that's every single question from this part reviewed. Um, again, if you want to keep reviewing to go over part C, which is the final part of this exam, um, that video is already uploaded. It's going to be in the description of this one. Again, if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. I hope you guys learned something and I hope you guys have a nice night.